Coming up on our newscast, President-elect Yoon Jong-yeol will host a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden. It's looked to be one of the first actions of his administration when he takes office in May. The nation's two tech titans logged record high Q1 sales. Samsung thanks to semiconductor and smartphone sectors. LG was driven by home appliances and auto parts. The 23rd Jeonju International Film Festival begins. More than 200 works will be showcased over 10 days. Hello and welcome. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. President-elect Yoon Sang-yeol is set to host U.S. President Joe Biden in May. Likely topics include strengthening alliance as well as cooperation on North Korea. This will be just before Biden heads to Japan for a summit with the so-called Quad countries. Yoon Jung-min starts us off. South Korean President Oleg Yoon Song yeol will hold his first summit with U.S. President Joe Biden in Seoul on May 21st, only 11 days after his inauguration in May. A statement by his spokesperson on Thursday said the president-elect welcomed Biden's visit to South Korea from May 20th to 22nd. Yoon said the upcoming summit will be an opportune moment for discussions on economic security and science technology amid increasing nuclear and missile threats from North Korea and global supply chain risks. The two will be discussing the bilateral alliance, cooperation on North Korea, economic security and global issues for a comprehensive strategic alliance between Seoul and Washington. Along with cooperation on U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, experts say the summit will also likely focus on North Korea policy. North Korea, I think, you know, is military provocation is getting heightened, possibly another nuclear test is possible. So in that case, how two countries can cope with North Korea issues, how they can adjust their North Korea policies afterwards. The statement emphasized that the upcoming South Korea-U.S. summit is to be held in the shortest time after the inauguration of a new South Korean government. The two countries will communicate through diplomatic channels for Biden's visit, and the Presidential Transition Committee say they will make full preparations. The White House announced on Wednesday that President Biden will visit South Korea and Japan from May 20th to 24th, which will be his first visits to the country since taking office. It said the trip will advance the Biden administration's rock-solid commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific and to U.S. treaty alliances with the two countries. The Biden administration has been stressing the importance of bilateral and trilateral cooperation with its key allies in Asia, South Korea and Japan, apparently to counter China's influence. After staying in Korea, Biden is scheduled to visit Tokyo for a meeting with the leaders of the Quad Group of Australia, Japan and India. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Top defense experts gathered in Seoul for an open forum on North Korea's nuclear threat. Participants shared insights on the situation on the peninsula, with one expert warning the regime's seventh nuclear test could be held soon. Han sung brings the highlights from that session. A South Korean government researcher predicts North Korea will conduct its seventh nuclear test, test fire another intercontinental ballistic missile, and also launch military satellites sometime after May, as the regime continues to expand its nuclear program. U.S. President Joe Biden is visiting South Korea in May, so the North may be considering doing it then. The projection came at a forum held by the Korea Institute for National Defense Analyses on Thursday in Seoul, where the nation's top defense analysts came together to discuss North Korea's current nuclear capabilities and how South Korea should respond. Among dignitaries present were former South Korean Defense Ministry officials, including current vice president of the Korea Research Institute for National Strategy, Yoo jae who stressed in his keynote speech that North Korean nukes have already become a very tangible threat. From South Korea's perspective, North Korea has long since crossed the so-called red line. 
We must face the fact that the regime's tactical nuclear weapons and hypersonic missiles are aimed at us, not United States. In response to rising tensions, experts say South Korea must upgrade its so-called three-axis defense system into a more comprehensive program. Methodologically speaking, our current three-axis system's means of offense is rather limited to physical force. But this should be expanded to include non-physical means such as cyber, laser and electronic combat. The forum comes at a critical time, just a few days after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, during a speech at a military parade, seemingly threatened the preemptive use of nuclear weapons. Should the North's fundamental national interests come under threat. Han sung Arirang News. As part of a nationwide tour, President-elect Yoon travels to Chungcheong region this week. In Chan'an, he visited a railway station where the GTX Metropolitan Express line will be extended and was briefed on the project. He also visited a new town in Hongsong and then paid his respects to the Korean independence activist Yoon Bong-gil at a memorial hall in Yesan. Yoon also visited the cities of Daejeon and Asan. In a meeting on Wednesday with Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, he was invited to next year's Davos Forum. Schwab also met with the chair of the Presidential Transition Committee, An Chol Su, and discussed technologies related to memory semiconductors, AI, and secondary batteries. Amid the slowdown of infections in the nation, authorities are said to be leaning towards lifting the country's outdoor mask mandate, something that goes against what the Presidential Transition Committee's initial stance was. A final decision will be made on Friday. Shin Yeon brings the updates. South Korea is continuing to see an overall drop in daily COVID-19 infections. On Thursday, the country logged 57,464 new infections, down by more than 19,000 from the day before. To shift the pandemic to an endemic, authorities have asked for active booster shot participation from older adults. Authorities have cited studies from Israel that found people aged 60 and up who've received a second booster shot had a 78 percent lower death rate compared to those who had gotten just one. So far, only 10 percent of people in this age group in Korea have received a second booster shot. In light of the drop in infections, authorities have also been discussing whether to lift the outdoor mask mandate. The Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters is set to announce its final decision on Friday, which would mark two weeks since the country eased most of its distancing measures. Yonhap News Agency reported on Thursday that authorities are leaning towards lifting this mandate starting next Monday. This is mainly because the country has already downgraded COVID-19 as a level 2 infectious disease from the highest level 1. But lifting mask mandates in early May goes against the plans of the Presidential Transition Committee. While unveiling a 100-day roadmap on how the new Yoon administration will tackle COVID-19, the committee's chairman An Chol Su said they would only start considering lifting outdoor mask mandates from late May. Meanwhile, travelers to South Korea will still have to submit a negative PCR test result taken within 48 hours. While many have been asking for a reversal of this measure due to a small number of imported cases, health authorities said they would like to remain vigilant and stop any new variants from coming in. But authorities are considering whether to allow rapid antigen tests instead. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. During the election campaign, President-elect Yoon promised more compensation for small businesses hit by the current government's virus prevention measures. The Transition Committee laid out its plans for COVID-19 relief payments. Kim do has the details. The chairman of Presidential Transition Committee and COVID-19 response team, An Chol Su, says more than 5.5 million small businesses will be eligible for COVID-19 relief under the new compensation system. And according to the committee's calculations, in total, businesses lost 42.4 billion U.S. dollars while following the virus prevention measures put in place by the current government. During the election, because we were not the ruling party, we only had the estimates. But as we've become the ruling party, we were able to see clear data, which has been a big help. In addition to this, Chairman Ahn said the compensation rate will be raised from 90 percent set by the current government, meaning merchants will have more of their losses covered by the state. 
The incoming government also plans to raise the minimum amount given, which is currently 500,000 won, or roughly 400 U.S. dollars. Taking all this into consideration, the incoming government will come up with a second supplementary budget for this year. That will need parliamentary approval. So the UN administration will have to cooperate with its opposition, the Democratic Party of Korea, who holds the majority in the National Assembly. The specific amount for each business will be calculated depending on its losses, but according to reports, the team is considering capping the payment at around 4,700 U.S. dollars. On added, extending loan payment due dates and tax relief are also going to be used to help the suffering businesses. We're not just going to stop at compensating the losses. We want to help the businesses actually get back on their feet and become pillars to the country's economy. One of the major measures includes transferring business owners' loans from secondary financial institutions to major banks in the country, which would lower the interest rate. Kim do Arirang News. Russia claims to be in full control of Kherson in southern Ukraine and that the city will start using ruble from next month. There is also rumored to be a vote in the works to create another pro-Russian republic like the ones in the east. But the locals may not support the presence of Russian troops who used tear gas and stun grenades recently. Kim hyun sung has the latest. In the southern city of Ukraine, Kherson, protesters gathered in the Freedom Square on Wednesday. They're out to protest Russian control. In early March, the Russian news agency RIA said Russian forces had completely taken over the region. This Tuesday, Russian forces reappointed the Kherson mayor Volodymyr Saldo as the head of the regional state administration. The Russian defense ministry said on Tuesday that Kherson had been, in its words, liberated. But the chants and tear gas say otherwise. The placard reads, they come into my house uninvited, a new word and a new law. The RIA news agency also reported that from May 1st, Kherson will transition into using, as currency, the Russian ruble. According to the report, the following four months will be a transition period, during which time the ruble and the Ukrainian hirvinia will both circulate. The report also said that the Russian ruble is already widely used locally. According to RIA, Russian television and radio have been on the air in Kherson. But late on Wednesday, several explosions erupted near the television tower, knocking Russian channels off the air temporarily. Ria said there were rockets fired from the northwest, the direction of Ukrainian forces. Kim Yansen, Arirang News. Staying in Ukraine, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited areas outside Kyiv and called the war evil. He also stopped by Bucha and Urban region scarred by the war. Looking at the blackened and bombarded cities, Guterres said civilians always pay the highest price. The UN chief also added that he is glad that the International Criminal Court is looking into conducting a thorough investigation and holding the responsible parties accountable. I imagine my family in one of those houses that is now destroyed and black. So the war is an absurdity in the 21st century. The war is evil. Shifting our focus to other parts of the world, Beijing is expanding its COVID-19 lockdowns to Chaoyang with a population of 3.5 million. Iron fences are blocking entrances to apartment buildings while police and security agents are roaming the area to prevent people from going out. Clubs, entertainment facilities, performance halls and internet cafes are also shut down. This comes as health authorities reported 50 new cases on Thursday. The lockdowns will remain in place until the daily tally reaches zero. Residents are concerned the entirety of Beijing will soon be under a strict lockdown. South Korea's two biggest tech titans beat market expectations in Q1, logging their highest ever quarterly sales. Samsung achieved this feat thanks to semiconductor and smartphone sectors. LG was driven by home appliances and auto parts. 
Here's Am Jiang with a breakdown of the digits. Samsung Electronics for the third straight quarter has logged its highest ever sales for respective quarters. The South Korean tech giant announced on Thursday that its sales from January to March jumped 19 percent on-year, amounting to a record 61 billion U.S. dollars, reaching an all-time high in quarterly sales. Samsung also said its operating profit for the first quarter stands at roughly $11 billion, up more than 50 percent on-year. Samsung attributed the rise to its smartphone and home appliance businesses, recording their highest quarterly sales since 2013. Analysts say despite the first quarter usually being a slow time of the year, robust sales of semiconductors and displays led to the strong earnings performance. Better performance of memory, semiconductor and foundry businesses has largely driven Samsung Electronics solid earnings. Flexible OLED also recorded better than expected earnings, which led Samsung Display to post robust sales. The analyst also said the earnings are expected to be higher in the coming months as Samsung Electronics conventionally enters its peak season in the second half of the year. Meanwhile, LG Electronics also posted earnings that were far better than market expectations. It logged an all-time high quarterly sales of around $17 billion, a surge of around 19 percent compared to the same period a year earlier. The operating profit for the period came to a record of about $1.5 billion, up over 6 percent on-year. The company said sales for its home appliances and air solution businesses hit record highs in quarterly sales in the first three months of this year. One analyst says LG's auto parts division managing to reduce losses has contributed to the strong earnings performance. LG Electronics Auto Parts have reached economies of scale and its losses significantly shrank as the product mix became more profitable with a rise in powertrains and headlamps. He added that in the second quarter, the company's auto parts division is expected to turn into a profit-making business. Om Jiyong, Arirang News. Though much of the quarantine rules have been lifted, the pandemic has left us with some tasks to do before traveling overseas. So what should we take note of in terms of preparations and expectations when taking flight? Irene went to a tourist hotspot in the Philippines to show us how COVID-19 changed the way people travel. It's been more than two years since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And people are now once again eager to travel abroad as countries around the world begin to reopen up their borders. However, compared to the pre-pandemic levels, some entry procedures have changed and global travelers are being notified of updated safety guidelines. I myself have had the chance to travel overseas for a business trip after two years of the pandemic, and these are some of the unfamiliar things that I've experienced. When traveling to another country, you should find out their entry policy for foreigners. Some countries require a PCR test and quarantine period after arrival, while some are lifting quarantine measure for fully vaccinated travelers. The Philippines, where I visited, did not require fully vaccinated foreign travelers to quarantine, but travelers do have to take an antigen test 24 hours prior to departure or a PCR test 48 hours beforehand to prove their negative status. Also, the country strictly managed travelers' health by requiring that visitors download a mobile QR code showing their flight details, where they are staying, vaccination status and more health-related information. In popular tourist spots like Boracay, some water sports activities have now resumed after two years of being closed, with travelers excited about being able to enjoy get back to having fun in the water. The pandemic has resulted in job losses here in Boracay. But with tourism booming again, everything is getting back to normal. Um, it's great to be back out traveling again, but this is my first time going abroad in two years. And it's so nice to experience another culture and different food and meet people. So I'm really happy I came. 
And some store owners at the tourist spot were looking forward to welcoming many overseas travelers to Boracay Island again. I'm so glad and so blessed because there's a new hope for us a, to gain more income. However, mask wearing is still mandatory for everyone to prevent infections, except while eating and drinking in restaurants. Maintaining at least a two-meter distance when indoors is also recommended. And some shopping centers and restaurants and cafes require guests to scan their health pass QR code when entering. Although some virus restrictions remain at tourist spots, many are now looking to travel abroad as a way to escape from the stresses of the pandemic. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News, Boracay. The country's biggest showcase of independent and experimental films, Tachonju International Film Festival, has kicked off. The global event is back to full scale and in person for the first time in three years. Kim bo provides a glimpse of what to expect. Shining light on independent, experimental films. The 23rd edition of Cheonju International Film Festival has kicked off its 10-day journey on Thursday. This year's festival is significant in that it is full-scale and in-person. Festival landmark, the Cheonju Dome, has been set up for the first time in three years and will act as a centerpiece for the entire festival until the closing ceremony takes place on May 7th. Hosted by Yuinna and Chang Yun-sung, the opening ceremony featured guests from both domestic and abroad, including director Im Sang-soo. The festival will showcase 217 films from over 50 countries. Widely known for having directed the Apple TV Plus drama series Pachinko, Kogunara's film titled After Yang opened up the festival, sharing the story of a family getting to know an android's stored memories after it unexpectedly breaks down. This film is a reflection of humankind. We thought it was interesting how the film showed the way the android viewed people, and the film delivers that in a tranquil and calm way. We all decided to go with this as the opening film. I think one of the themes of this movie is to slow down and to look at the small moments of life that we often pass by. And I think the pandemic has reminded us to slow down and to really savor each of these things that we do in life. So I don't think uh, it could be more timely that the movie is being shared at this moment in time. Special programs make the festival a more dynamic experience, such as a retrospective on director Yi Chang-dong, director Yeon sang wos selection of films, and even a music festival. The committee also came up with a Ukrainian day to send the support through film. This year we have a um, Ukrainian day, uh, which is on April 30. We will screen uh, th three films. One is a uh, Ukrainian film uh, directed by Ukrainian director, which we selected last year in the competition section. We don't know how we can support them directly. Obviously, there is another way, but as a film festival, we like to show films, Ukrainian films, for, for showing support. Returning to full scale for the first time since the pandemic, the festival invites movie lovers from far and wide to watch independent films and discuss them with like-minded people. For those who cannot visit, over 100 films are available through festival's online platform. Kim bo Arirang News, Jeonju. The nation's capital will test run its own metaverse platform next Monday. Seoul Metropolitan Government has been working with the Seoul Institute of Technology to create the space that people can use for a wide range of economic and cultural activities. It's only a prototype at this point, but the first services to be tested will be for creating avatars and seeing the areas around Seoul Plaza change with the weather. There will also be functions for hosting online meetings and conferences. Breezier spells are expected across the nation tomorrow. We have light rain in the forecast nationwide for the morning hours. After the rain, a surge of cold air will filter in and most regions will see maximum temperatures below the seasonal norms. Under overcast skies, eastern regions will be especially breezy at below 15 degrees for the daytime. 
The amount of rain won't be too much for inland regions, including the capital. We'll see about five millimeters of rainfall. Parts of Gangwon-do province and Jeju Island will see relatively heavier showers of up to 30 millimeters. For mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province, where temperatures will be especially cold, rain may turn into snowfall. Morning lows will be in double figures nationwide. Seoul and Gwangju will start off at 12 degrees Celsius. After the rain, overcast skies are expected for the daytime. Seoul will get up to 19 degrees, Daejeon 18, and Gyeongju will reach 13 degrees Celsius. Temperatures will stay relatively breezy until this weekend. Clear skies will make a return this coming Sunday. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. That's all from us. As always, thank you for watching.